So welcome everyone to our Wednesday webinar for today. The topic is how to sell more when you're too nice to sell. And this is a great topic. I'm very excited to talk about this. I truly believe that this is something we can all relate to to some degree. And, you know, we all have our kind of our own personal journey with this. Um, I have my, had mine as well, which is what I'll be talking a lot about today. Um, but even if you don't feel like you're too nice to sell, my, I guess my challenge, especially if you manage or lead a sales team, is someone on your team probably does and might not feel comfortable enough to talk about it. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce myself and my background. So this is me. Again, my name is Mike Macchiarelli. Um, that is my gorgeous, uh, our gorgeous miniature Husky, my wife and I. His name is Cody Bear. He is four years old. We love to hike. So we are on top of a mountain called Bear Mountain. Uh, we live in Elmsford, New York, which is just about 25, uh, 25 miles north of New York City. And as for my sales background, uh, prior to KO Advantage Group, I spent the last seven years with Equinox Fitness, and I think uh, everybody who's on here so far that I saw the locations would probably be familiar because we do have Toronto, we have California nationwide. It is a luxury fitness club chain. We also have one hotel at the Hudson Yards in New York City. Um, so seven years ago, I started with Equinox, and I started my first year and a half or so as a membership advisor at the Darien, Connecticut location. After about a year, I was promoted to a regional sales manager for Westchester and Connecticut, leading the teams at our clubs, at our six clubs in Westchester, Connecticut. Five years as a regional sales manager. However, for four of those years, um, you know, my, uh, I guess my success was in helping lead turnaround teams. So we have an award uh, uh, kind of gala every year at Equinox. And uh, there was an award, Turnaround Club of the Year. And this is uh, something that I actually helped my team um, win my first year as a salesperson at the Darien, Connecticut location. And uh, I actually have been able to help the teams that I've led as regional sales manager win that award two more times. So I'm very proud that in my five years, I've actually won that award three times. And uh, you have to be within the top five out of 100 clubs and make the biggest difference from one year to the next in sales. Because of my success in doing that, I was invited to help lead our corporate sales training. So for about four years, I was leading corporate sales training in New York City, helped to train over 1,000 of our employees, not just salespeople. Um, Equinox would send everyone as their first stop as the onboarding for the company. Um, executives, the COO, the CMO, and everything um, from there on down to the membership advisor would go to sales training to learn about sales because sales are the lifeblood of any business. And finally, this spring, I had the amazing opportunity to join KO Advantage Group and start the next chapter in my career and in my sales journey and kind of make a transition of my own from the B2C space to the B2B space. Who are we? Who is KO Advantage Group? We are the leading sales process based in Canada, built on connecting clients with emotional intelligence for high value deals. But what do we really do? What do we really provide? What we really provide is relief, is, is, is the ability to predict the size, the consistency, the dates of when deals are going to close so we can all sleep at night. With that comes the empowerment as well to gain the right clients at the right time. That is an empowering feeling. If you have the consistency of knowing that deals will, will happen when they're supposed to, and that they're going to be happening in the future with the right people and that there is a proven process that can be replicated and leaned into, which is what we're really gonna focus on today. Um, that will create much less anxiety and much less uncertainty in sales. And I think we could probably all agree that uh, there's definitely enough anxiety and uncertainty in our world today. So anything we can do to reduce that is definitely going to be welcome. But first, I'd like to go back. I want to I wanna go all the way back to seven years ago when I had first started for Equinox. This was at the time, this was around 2013, going on 2014. I was finishing my degree for college, and I uh, was studying history. I originally wanted to be a history professor. And 
uh, at that time, while I was going to college, I was working in retail for a couple different national retail chains, and I kind of enjoyed customer service and the sales aspect of it. Um, but my degree was in history, um, and that is where I thought I was going to go. What changed? Well, about a year before I graduated, my parents actually moved from Connecticut to Texas. So there I was on my own. My sister had moved out as well earlier in, into New York City and some surrounding areas. I was in Connecticut by myself. And then I was finally upon graduating. My parents let me know we're going to be selling the house. I was living in the house that uh, I grew up in without my parents. And they let me know though, when you graduate, it's time. You know, we, we need to kind of uh, get, our, get our stuff in order and we've given you enough time uh, to, to live with us and then live in the house. So ultimately I knew that once I graduated now at the end of that year, I had to figure out what I was gonna do. I kind of had two forks in the road. I had a path that I saw and one path was continuing on as a history major, going to get my master's degree and my potentially my PhD. However, that was also at the time, you know, we had kind of just come off of the Great Recession. I had, was hearing all these horror stories of, uh, you know, taxi drivers with, with PhDs. And which is funny now, because looking back, like that seems so outdated right now, I guess it'd be Uber drivers with PhDs. Um, however, that gave me uh, a lot of anxiety and I, that I really didn't create a lot of confidence that that was the path that was going to be uh, a way for me to take care of myself. The, the other side was, what was I going to do? If not that, what else? And luckily at that time, it was at that time, I was in the final semester of my, uh, my last year in college when my sister forwarded me the job listing at Equinox for a sales position. And it was mostly commission, a mostly commissioned sales position. Even though I thought I'd be great, I read about the position. It seemed like it was something that was uh, really aligned to what I was passionate about at that time. I've always loved fitness. Um, and I knew that I was good at sales and customer service for my time in retail, but I was still concerned. I, I struggled with the decision. Like, it, was this a good idea to take a mostly commissioned sales position? And I was, I was a little bit nervous for a few different reasons. Number one, um, I still had a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth of what sales was from my days in retail. You know, at that time, it was like upsell, 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 like sell to everyone. We want everyone to leave with multiple products, no matter what. And that's what they measured. It wasn't like if, if, if a person bought one, one item, that was not a success. They wanted three items or five items per transaction. And it didn't matter what it took to get there, get them to three or five items per transaction. That created a lot of conflict, a lot of cognitive distance. And I, I really like, I remember like having conversations with my manager about not being comfortable. And truthfully, like I did not last much longer because I wasn't able to overcome that discomfort at that time. Another reason I was not so sure was I, you know, I, I, had never, I had never done sales to this level before. Like, was I really going to, how was I going to learn? Like, how would I know what to do and when to do it? Nobody had ever taught me that before. Luckily, I started a sales training. I decided to go ahead and take the position. And even though uh, I wasn't sure, I, had, I did have the confidence that I could handle it. And the reason, part of the reason I had the confidence that I could handle it is even though I felt I might be a little bit too nice for like real sales, the impression that I had of sales at that time, I'd always been told I was a nice person. And I actually even started boxing in my mid twenties because like consciously because I thought I was too nice. I literally did it to start to toughen myself up. I remember being out in my early twenties with people, with friends at bars. And I was like, what if something happens? Like, am I gonna be like able to defend myself? I'm, like if somebody like confronts me, am I just gonna like run away with my tail between my legs? Like, I, I, I gotta like do something about this. And I started boxing and that was amazing. And it taught me so many things that, that translate into life and that translate into sales. Um, and we will not go over all those today. That might make a great future webinar actually. Um, but the number one thing is it taught me confidence. Because when you're, when you're boxing, when you, when you bite down on that mouthpiece and when the bell rings and it's hit or be hit and you follow through and you do it and you survive, 
you know you can handle everything else and just about everything else is a walk in the park after that. So I, I really credit the confidence from that for me to actually take that leap. But I'm happy I did because my first step after I took that leap was going to sales training. And what I learned at sales training for the first time ever was a process. I finally had the relief knowing that there was going to be a process that had worked, that had proved, that had worked for other people over and over and over again. And all I had to do was just apply that process the best I could. That was the sales process back then at Equinox. This, however, this slide that you're seeing right now is our sales cycle at KO Sales U that we teach our students. We teach this sales cycle and it aligns with the buyer's journey, which is something we'll talk about shortly. Most important though, is the first step, is prospecting. And the reason why that is so important is because one of my favorite quotes is by Aristotle, and that is, well begun is half done. Well begun is half done, and I truly believe that, and I've seen that over and over and over again in sales. Starting with the right prospecting is what will enable us to, to remove so much of the frustration, so much of the conflict, and so much of the uh, you know, anxiety over wh whether we should push for the close later on in the process. So number one, we want to spend time only with our ideal clients. Starting place, do we understand who our ideal buyer persona is? If we can understand our values, what values do we share? Now we can try to align them with our potential clients. And we know that if we share the values that a conversation can be had, a relationship can be made, but we have to be intentional about this. We want to fish where there are fish. And that is, and, and, and again, it's understanding that it's not, it's, it's a specific type, it's not everyone. And that is something else I learned at that sales training that was so impactful that finally gave me a little bit of relief that I was out of the world of retail, where it was push everything on everyone. The first thing that they would say that they, that they taught us was that Equinox was not for everyone. Equinox is not for everyone. And I was like, wow, like that's not the message I was expecting to get at sales training is that Equinox is not for everyone. I thought I was going to get like the opposite message. So I was very, very happy and I felt very empowered by that because now I had control and now I had choices. It's so important. Sell to everyone, sell to no one. Can you create a list of 100s? Have you created, have you refined, have you updated? Who are your, going to be your 100 best high value prospects, your ideal prospects? where not only with a sales process will be a joy, but the relationship, the entire service. And meeting the buyer on their own journey. So understanding and having a process of your, of your own is so important, but also understanding the process that the buyer's going through. Sales is not something you do to someone. Sales is something you do with and through someone. And that is a Zig Ziglar quote. And that is another uh, really great mindset to understand that sales is not a bad thing. We are helping the person maximize their potential and make a positive change in their life. However, they are on a journey and we have to be with them on this journey. We have to meet them where we are, where they are, and guide them. We are not a tour guide pulling a cat on a leash. That's not going to go so well. So here is the buyer's journey. First step is awareness of a problem. Before we move on to the other steps, awareness of the problem is so important. Again, well begun is half done. And I would like to give you all a question to either to think about first, and maybe you can ask it literally to clients in your conversations as well. What would have to happen for your prospect or potential client to realize that they had a problem. And I'll say that again. What would have to happen specifically for your potential client or prospect to know that they have a problem? 
So in the fitness industry, you know, we learn about emotional triggers. And, and you know, uh, usually when someone inquired, it was because something happened, you know, they're, they're something uh, emotionally now, they were uncomfortable or uh, something was wrong. You know, maybe they went to the doctor and the doctor told them, you have to get healthy. Otherwise, you will have, um, you know, heart disease, diabetes, God forbid, hopefully none of them. Maybe it was appearance. Maybe it was judgment. Maybe it was shame, frustration going up in that pant size. Who knows? It seems superficial, but at the end of the day, there are emotional forces behind every single, uh, every single sale. And that's even true for business to business. Because if we have an awareness of a problem in business, even if it's you know, not enough revenue, even if it's, we didn't meet our projections, we didn't get the return on investment. Now, what does that mean? That's still going to cause an emotional reaction that actually motivates someone to seek a solution. Understanding there's a problem will not cause one, someone to seek a solution and follow through. Feeling emotionally motivated at a really core level will cause that. This is the journey. Awareness of the problem. Seeking a solution. Now this is where we get to come in. Involving others in the process. And that is something that's a little bit different that we might not expect. And we should never be surprised that there's always going to be others involved in the process. There's always a secondary or third party who is going to be an influencer. They may not be the decision maker, but they will be the influencer. Challenging of the fit, that is also going to be part of the process. So please know, just be ready that this is going to happen and it's natural. If you look at the two forces that motivate people to make any kind of change or take any action, there is approach forces and there is avoid forces. And, and the way it works psychologically looks very similar to the way this is laid out. So once there's awareness of a problem and they're seeking a solution, they're, a, they're a, approaching a solution. It is later on only before they finally make a decision, before we finally make a decision to make a change, to get out of our comfort zone, to take a risk, that now the avoid forces creep in and they creep in hard. This is like the concept of cold feet before getting married. And that is natural. So you just have to be ready for it. If it's an objection, if it's a challenge, if it's a delay. Something my sales mentor used to tell me, Equinox, is just take a deep breath and say namaste. And then, and then, a, and then handle it from a place of caring and helping them solve their problem. Qualifying is the next way that we will now feel empowered to understand that we are helping someone. We should be having a, a, a qualifying conversation to make sure that we are weeding out people we can't help. If we're weeding out the people we can't help or shouldn't help and moving forward with the people that we can and we should, we are, we are doing a service. And at the end of the day, if we are doing a service, that will be welcomed. How do we qualify? The easiest way is to focus on budget, authority, need, and timeline, also known as BAM. Focusing on the investment, not the cost. How will the client determine it was the best experience their money can buy? And through qualifying, we will understand whether it's looking at budget or looking at need or what have you, ultimately, we will understand that this is going to, this could potentially be a fit. And it's important also to recognize that a budget tells us what we can afford, but it doesn't stop us from buying it. That is something now, if, if whether you're new to sales or feeling like you're too nice to sell, this is something to really now grasp and internalize. Something else I learned from a mentor is never think with your wallet, your own wallet. You have to remove yourself from the situation. And it's so true that a budget, budget tells us what we can afford, but it doesn't stop us from buying it. I mean, think of a vacation. So I'm sure, you know, hopefully, uh, actually this year probably haven't been many vacations for us. Um, but I think of a vacation from 2019, the spring of last year. And this is a perfect example of the budget telling us what we can't afford, but doesn't stop us from buying it. So my wife and I planned a trip to Jamaica for our five-year anniversary in March. We were so excited. We got... We, I guess we weren't excited enough though, because we actually, for the first time ever, got to the airport late and missed the plane. We were standing in the airport, 
uh, speechless that we actually did that. And I, I remember going up to the gate to talk to the ticketing agent and I'm like, all right, I need the next flight to Jamaica. And she's like, there isn't one. And I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? She's like, there's, there's not another one. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but like the next one. And she's like, well, there's not really another one for two days. Okay, was not expecting that. What do we do now? Well, I mean, logically, we probably should have just gone back home and planned something better or uh, saved up again or what have you. What did we do though? We could not deal with the emotional discomfort, with the disappointment. We could not go home with our tail between our legs and just say goodbye to the vacation that we already had our minds and hearts set on. So what do we do? I got on Expedia in that terminal, looked up flights, looked up hotel rooms, and with half an hour booked a flight to Vegas, leaving from a different terminal at the same airport later that day, and replaced the nights we were staying in Jamaica with nights at the Wynn in Las Vegas. And we went, we hopped over a terminal, we landed at midnight, had the time of our lives. Moral of the story is we didn't have two vacations in one week in the budget, but it did not stop us from buying it. The travel industry is in and vacations are such a great example of the difference between destination and transportation. And this is something else we want to make sure we're incorporating when we are selling. We're going to focus where we're taking our clients, not where, not how they're going to get there. And airlines are the masters of this. You know, it, the reality is airline travel sucks. Like if airlines focused on what it was going to be like to wait in security and go through TSA and what it was going to be like to wait on the plane while it takes off and sit in a tiny little seat with our legs cramped, not have much access to food or water or have to pay extra. I mean, we probably would never even get on the plane. What did they do? They focus on the destination. They, they focus on Cancun. What is it going to be like what is it gonna feel like when we reach that destination? And same thing for booking vacation rooms. You know, my, my wife and I will look at vacations and I'm sure we all do this, you know, and, and it's like, you know, usually we look when it's like fall in, in New York and it's cold and it's, uh, you know, we need like a light at the end of the tunnel because it's cold, it's like it's frigid. It's, you know, there's snow, we're not gonna be going anywhere. We'll usually book a vacation for the spring. And when we go and look at the videos, what do we see? We see, uh, you know, couples laughing and, and dancing and, and relaxing on the beach and in the jacuzzi and getting a, a massage at the spa. And, and that's what they're showing you is that, that, that end result is the, the, the blissful, the pleasure, the experience. Now, what, what we're trying to find, though, is what, is, is what they're showing in, in, those, in the videos, in, 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 in the marketing, is the ideal state, right? Not the, trans, not, not, the, not, the, not the transportation, not the journey to and from, the, the ideal state, the end result that we want to get to. How do we find that ideal state with our clients, with our prospects? We do that by asking better questions. There are two types of questions two basic types of questions. One is open-ended questions. And these are the questions that are gonna enable us to gain the insight we need to now create the, to understand the ideal state that our prospects are wanting to go to. Close-ended questions we use for confirmation. So open-ended questions is what we'll want to use more of. We want to gain the information. Let the, let the client, the prospect talk. That is another, you know, uh, uh, stereotype, uh, negative stereotype of sales and people who feel, I don't know if sales for me, sales is, I'm, I might be too nice, or I might, I don't want to be like, you know, pushy or aggressive with people because they think they have to do all the talking and they're like jamming information down people's mouths. The reality is not, that is, is actually the opposite. We have two ears and one mouth so we can listen twice, twice as often as we speak. And that is what we want to focus on. We want to be listening louder. We want to be asking the open-ended questions to keep it moving along. We want to ask the closed-ended questions to confirm. 
that we are understanding and receiving the information, but ultimately we are listening more than twice as much as we are speaking. We're also anchoring expectations. So something else that causes you know, confrontation or conflict later in the sales cycle is going to be anchoring expectations uh, or not, not anchoring expectations. So we wanna make sure that we are doing this early and especially, you know, we're presenting the higher, the, the higher price, the worst case scenario option first, and then moving down to a, you know, a second, a better, a faster, a more streamlined option. And this gives our client choices, which is also one of the number one ways to, um, you know, sell in a way that is not confrontational is, is when you're giving someone choices, you're really just providing information and options. It's not set, it's not like, you know, one my way or the highway. And with the, with the anchoring the expectations comes in the psychology. And psychology is such a huge part of sales. Emotional intelligence specifically. In emotional intelligence, the heart knows what the head needs. There's, there's two places to focus for the emotional intelligence. One is making sure that we understand ourselves. Do we understand ourselves to the degree that enables us to present the best version of ourselves and communicate as the best version of ourselves? And also, are we able to understand how other people would be feeling or are feeling at different points in the sales interaction. And the more we can, the more we can empathize, the more we can understand, you know, the different uh, psychological forces that we all experience. So one is like, you know, autonomy. It's like the, one of the basic human needs is this idea that like people want to feel free and unencumbered. They want to, they do want to be without being imposed upon, right? And that's what sales feels like. Like sales feels like we're imposing on them. And that does, that need not be the case, but we have to recognize that, that if someone feels that way, then the rest is, the, the rest is just, uh, uh, you know, not even relevant, right? And we don't want to be turning people off. If we have the understanding of the emotional intelligence though, now we can sell from a more effective standpoint. Recognizing that 95% of our purchase decisions take place subconsciously. And this is something that Harvard Business Review has written about and studied. Malcolm Gladwell, one of my favorite authors, writes about in Blink. This happens in a fraction, uh, uh, you know, many decisions happen in a fraction of a, of a second, but all decisions, the majority of the decision is actually taking place subconsciously. which is why we have to recognize that people buy an emotion and justify with logic. Are we helping someone else on this emotional journey? And are we asking the right questions? And there's three different types of questions you wanna make sure you're incorporating into every sales conversation. And this is something I definitely recommend taking a note of because this could be a game changer for your conversations. There are three different types. The first type are look questions right? These are more logical. Like what would, if, if, if you were successful making this change, what would success look like? Like, what would this look like? Let's say you did this or made this change three to six months from now, what would be the ideal result? And what specifically would that look like? Right? That's one level. The next level are the feel questions, right? So what, what would success look like? Number two, now we're moving up a pyramid. What would that feel like? What would success, what would reaching that goal, what would actually achieving that success now feel like? And number three, at the highest point of the period, is, are the B questions. And now we're tapping into identity, which is the strongest emotional force in all of human behavior. Who would you be? Who will you be when you achieve this? When you realize that success, when you see that ideal state, come to fruition, who will you be then compared to who you are now?
if anything, we want to make sure that every interaction is a joy. Because it's something else that's a little bit of a misnomer of sales is that it's a one and done, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, that happens uh, or doesn't happen, which is really not the case. Sales is a relationship. And most sales take anywhere from five to 16 follow-up attempts, calls, emails, et cetera, to actually close. We wanna be preparing for an interaction that leaves a positive taste in someone's mouth because the reality is it's going to take more interactions to close. How are we meeting? Where are we meeting in terms of where this client is at? Most importantly, what do people feel when we're talking with them? What do people feel when we're having a conversation, when we're asking questions? Are they coming from a place of caring? Are they coming from a place of curiosity? And this is one of the number one mistakes that I've seen salespeople make and the salespeople that I've trained. And it's something that I recommend looking out for in yourself and something that I recommend looking out for if you have a sales team. One of the biggest mistakes is simply just being too serious. Like, like if, 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 they're spending, if you're spending time with a prospect or you spend half an hour, an hour, and they don't smile or laugh, like chances are you know, you've, you, now you've got bigger problems, right, than convincing them of your value proposition. You're going to have to have one hell of a value proposition to close someone when they don't even enjoy the experience. So much of today, the majority of today that we compete on in a world where everything feels commoditized and we can get information at the touch of our fingertips is the experience, Are we creating value constantly? Constantly, again, in every single conversation, and there's more than one way to create value. Value can be through a relationship. Value can be asking questions that make people think about things that they haven't thought about before. Open up new doors and new possibilities. Are we giving information? Are we providing the right knowledge that's gonna equip someone now to maximize their potential in a way they couldn't have done without that knowledge. Either way, all of these interactions along the, the process that we spoke about earlier, the, you know, the buyer's journey, all of, these, all of these steps are an opportunity to create some kind of value. And when you create value like this, what will happen is two things. You will create value and you will close the sale or you will create value. It might not be the right fit at that time but you will have a new fan. You will have a new relationship. And someone who has received value from you is going to be an asset to your business. They might be a future sale or they just might be someone who can open a door for you uh, to, a, to someone who is that better fit uh, for a referral. Not all referrals have to be from active clients. They could be, if you're doing your job right, and I've seen this from my best sales people that I have managed, if you're doing your job right, Referrals will come from even the non-clients that you've spoken with. Another great question to, to write down and spend some time thinking about today is would your client be willing to pay for the experience created in your sales call? Go ahead and let me know in the chat right now. What do you think? Gut reaction. Okay, yeah. I love it. Honest, listen, I, it, it, honesty is good. And in, whether it's yes, you know, or no, or I'm not sure, audit yourself, you know, take the time to audit yourself. And it's a great question, you know, and you can ask like, was this valuable for you? Another mistake to avoid is not emailing so much, right? I mean, if we want to move past like the bare minimum of some kind of relationship, 
we want to be moving off of the email. We can, move to, we can move to phone, we can move to Zoom. And one of the great things about Zoom, especially with proposals, right? So we want to be making sure that we're, our, our proposals especially should not be emailed to the prospects. If it matters, put care into it. If they're important, show them. We should be, we should be meeting via phone or via Zoom to walk clients through our proposals. And the great thing about Zoom as well is now you have a recording. So they have a recording of the proposal. And if there's other influencers, remember going back to the buyer's journey, if there's other influencers that are not going to be participating in a part of this decision, they can watch the recording as well. Finally, we want to think about this as the first day of the rest of our lives, right? With a prospect, day one of a new relationship. Your prospect has gone on a journey with you. They will want to continue. Show them that you care. Believe in the relationships. Relationship first. One of my favorite quotes that I always go back to, and I think it's uh, just a very empowering quote, is you don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to be great. And that is what I would encourage everyone. So, you know, even if you're not new to sales, we can still always try to be great. And what I, would, what I would say is really figure out if you have the right sales process. Because if you don't have the right process, if you don't have a process or if you don't have the right process, a lot of this stuff is not going to matter in the end. You will be spinning your wheels. You will be banging your head against the wall. One of the worst things, if not the worst thing, that we can do in a sales interaction that will cause frustration and animosity on our part, on, our, on the buyer's part, is to wing it. If anything else, at, all, at, at, at any cost, do not wing it. Steve, who is one of our students, you know, started asking questions, right? That would, that would activate the emotion in the prospect. How would that make you feel, right? A feel question. What kind of leader would you become for your community? B question. Someone who thought maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm too nice to sell is now asking these questions, the right questions and forexing his revenue. Anita Lee, someone else we've helped. I'm finding that I'm improving with each meeting and role play and not even just in sales, but also in my communications and personal relationships. Again, applying what we talked about today, finding the right people, the right correct buyer persona, qualifying, asking the right questions, going on the journey, being with the prospect on their journey. Doug McKay, today we finalized a six-figure deal and the client countered with paying me more as a bonus. That's how you know you're doing it right. And that's what can happen, right? We are doing a service. And sometimes, you know, we, we, we never even want to think about, you know, getting paid more than we're asking for. We're so afraid to ask. It's like magic or something. Small adjustments, these small adjustments. Spend 15 minutes today thinking about, you know, would your client pay for your sales conversation? If yes, think why and what else could I do differently to make them want to pay more? If no, okay, great. What am I doing well now? What do I really need to focus on? How much more business can you close? I, 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 ask, I ask you, making some of these adjustments, how much more business can you close in the next 30 days? It might be more than you thought. It just might be a lot more than you thought, but we, want, we share this information because we want to help provide value for as many people as possible. That includes the slides. Here is the link, kimorleski.com slash ko webinars. We have these webinars every Wednesday. We love doing this and we love helping people. Our number one company value we share every webinar. 
and it goes so perfectly with the theme of this webinar, how to sell when you're too nice to sell, is, is by remembering this quote from Zig Ziglar, is that you can have everything you want in your life if you help enough other people get what they want. You can have everything you want in your life if you just help enough other people get what they want. And here is the link again to get the slides from this presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, we know you have other options for your time. So I thank you so much for spending this hour with me. I really hope that something resonated with you today. And I would love to know what that is. So if anything, let us know, please. What is the one thing you will do to take immediate action today? What was your one takeaway? There was a lot of information provided. You don't have to remember all of it. You can get the slides. The most important thing though, is to take action today and apply something. Make it stick. What is that one thing? Put it in the chat. Please let us know also if you have any questions, we'd be happy to take questions as well. Yes, thank you. Would the client pay for the information I gave? Yes, for the information, but also for the experience of meeting you, of meeting you and the questions, you know, did the questions make them think in a way that opened up new doors for their business, for their future? Yes, absolutely. We can always do a better job. Yep, Kim, we can always do a better job. Greg, yeah, I mean, have a process. When you, when you have a process, the beautiful thing about a process, if you have a process that knows that you know works, that's when you can really focus on helping and serving because the process is the process. And yeah, the look, feel, be questions. Those are a game changer. I'm telling you, apply those to your next conversation. Move up that pyramid. What would success look like? What would reaching your goals look like? How would that feel? Who would you be? 